Welcome to Unit 219, Creating a Social Media Strategy. Uh, this unit aims to provide an understanding of the practical application of knowledge of social media platforms as tools to promote products and services to a range of audiences. So we are going to be uh, coming up with an idea for a event or a product and you are going to be trying to organize a social media strategy for that. So in order to fulfill the learning outcome for this unit, uh, we're going to have to decide from the following four things what it is that you want to be promoting. So, is it going to be an esports tournament of your choice, uh, a new game launch, um, or a new console launch, or an online virtual games conference? So, pause the video here and just spend five minutes thinking about which one of these interests you enough to be able to come up with a strategy for it. So this is a purely theoretical exercise. Uh, the sky is the limit. Anything you want to include within all of these things is absolutely fine. So say you want Keanu Reeves to host the virtual games conference or star at the launch of the new game, then you can. Uh, if you want your games console to be the world's first quantum-based games console with insane technical specs, then you can. Uh, if you'd like the world's most famous streamers to host your eSports tournament, then you can. Uh, these decisions will then dictate the kind of key messages that you'll be feeding to the public or your target audience. Let's look at some of the history of social media. Um, many of you will have grown up with social media all of your lives, but it's good to get an idea of what this relatively new uh, style of media started out as, what it's become, and who are the big players. Okay, be honest. How many hours have you frittered away in the last week scrolling through your social feeds for the tiny dopamine high you get whenever someone gives you a like or a retweet? Honestly, I can't say I blame you. Social networking's underlying concept of create something, show it to people, and get excited when they like it is an extension of basic human nature that you see in everything from job interviews to those little mini valentines that nobody gave you back in the first grade. So it was only a matter of time before some enterprising folks would find a way to use the internet, which was already being hailed as this great new tool to connect people from all over the world, to examine patterns in online relationships and later to quantify them, satisfying our natural love of using numbers to rank what's most important. Of course, before social networking became mainstream, people were already sharing content online through fora, chat rooms, and tripod pages. But what was the first site that used the modern paradigm of creating profiles and sharing different kinds of information with a subset of that site's users that you were connected with somehow? A number of sites could try to claim that title, but a strong candidate was Six Degrees, which entered the scene in 1997. It featured plenty of elements that are now staples of social media, such as friends lists and instant messaging, but Unfortunately, they closed their digital doors in 2001 because, and this is basically the quintessential example of something being too far ahead of its time, there just weren't enough people on the internet back then to keep the site afloat. It wouldn't be until five years after Six Degrees was born that the first social networking service would hit a million users. Friendster, launched in 2002, quickly became widely popular by showing users not only how they were connected to others, but with a slicker presentation similar to online dating sites of the time. And, of course, they also benefited from the shrinking stigma around meeting people online due to the Internet's explosive growth. But, while Friendster quickly boasted a user base of over 3 million people, tough competition was on the horizon. If you're around the same age that I am, you probably fondly remember, or at least remember, MySpace. MySpace took a great deal of inspiration from Friendster, but 
because the folks behind MySpace already ran a company called eUniverse, which operated multiple websites for things like gaming and dating, MySpace had the advantage of being able to get the word out through eUniverse's existing user base. This helped them to rapidly become more popular than Friendster. In fact, Friendster's founder claimed that MySpace employees made posts on Friendster forums asking visitors to come join MySpace instead. MySpace was also able to develop new features for their site faster than Friendster, meaning for a while, the internet was awash in profile pages featuring strange backgrounds and weird sparkly GIFs. And real life was awash in novelty t-shirts directing onlookers to said pages. Of course, MySpace's dominance was also short-lived thanks to a famous Harvard dropout. No, not that one. That one. Mark Zuckerberg developed Facebook as a sophomore in 2004, originally intending it to be a campus-wide student directory, apparently because he was simply unhappy that it was freaking 2004 and the university still hadn't created one. After over a thousand Harvard students registered for the site the first day, Facebook started expanding to other schools, requiring a university or college email address in order to sign up. By the fall of 2005, most universities in the US had access to the site, its explosive growth fueled by the ease with which students could see who else they were connected to through classmates that they already knew. This early version of Facebook lacked modern features, acting as a digital replacement for university directories with much more emphasis on showing background information through user profiles. And the only way that visitors had of submitting anything to another user's page was by changing the wall, a block of text that any user's friends could edit at will. Early on, Facebook didn't have the same pull with advertisers as MySpace. But that all changed once Facebook opened itself up to the masses in 2006. And for better or for worse, Facebook quickly dwarfed MySpace. The most prominent reason for this being that the two sites diverged in terms of their functionality. Facebook's model was focused much more heavily on user-generated content and ways to make the networking part of social networking easier with pages, groups, and content sharing. MySpace, meanwhile, was widely considered to have spread itself too thin with extraneous features like karaoke that didn't work very well and a design that was quickly becoming clunky, slow, and outdated. MySpace also served their users with tons of ads and became susceptible to spam and malware, where Facebook was regarded as much better maintained with a cleaner design which had a very obvious influence on other social networks like VK in Russia and Renren in China. So in 2009, MySpace laid off 600 workers and after a couple of sales, it is still around, but as a music centric platform that's no longer trying to compete as a big time do it all social media service. Meanwhile, while Facebook and MySpace were grappling for social networking dominance, Twitter chirped onto the scene in late 2006. And although the social media space was already becoming crowded, Twitter stood out because it wasn't a copycat site. Instead of focusing on user profiles and a huge suite of social networking features, it was based on a much simpler idea, 140 character, non-editable, microblogging posts or tweets that could be used to reach everyone on the site instantly. This simplicity made it popular with convention goers at the 2007 edition of South by Southwest, leading to some serious publicity and an explosion in usage going from 20,000 tweets per day before the convention to 50 million in 2010. And of course, the introduction of the now ubiquitous and oft misused hashtag in 2007, which Twitter turned into hyperlinks in 2009 and then started using to determine what topics were trending in 2010. And it was this addition of trending to Twitter and then later Facebook that represented, well, the next big trend among the major social networking sites with many netizens turning at this point to trending topics and their customizable feeds instead of traditional media to get their breaking news. This drew in the extra advertising dollars that have allowed services like Facebook and Twitter to expand into areas like live broadcasting and embedding richer forms of media directly into their posts. 
The fact that the way that we interact with each other on social media sites has become mainstream means that we've actually even seen these social features of one kind or another implemented on other sites. Like how LinkedIn, a business networking site that's actually been around since 2002, now looks decidedly Facebook-like. Trending and community functions have shown up on YouTube, hashtags are on Instagram, which is now a Facebook subsidiary, and Reddit has a vote-based system which is roughly analogous to likes on other platforms. So I guess that pretty much wraps it up. Hopefully you've enjoyed this look at social networking enough to leave us a like and, oh shoot, wait, we forgot to talk about Google+. Plus. Uh, you know what, actually, you guys probably forgot about it too. Now, you can't talk about social media without first looking at the elephant in the room which is things like addiction and narcissism so you know it may not be immediately obvious that the designers of sites such as Facebook and Instagram have used addictive tendencies and narcissistic behavior as the backbone to their products but many traits of positive re reinforcement through likes and the phenomenon of the selfie are just two examples of how they play on human nature to engage their users um, if you don't think you're addicted to these kind of platforms, just imagine the feeling you get when you leave your house without your phone uh, or even lose your phone. So that's a, uh, an addiction quality. There's a very interesting interview here, which is uh, quite a long version. I'm going to cut down into certain bits where um, Jaron Lenier talks about how social media is ruining your life. Is there a principal reason why I should delete my social media? And if so, what is it? Mm. There are two. One of them is for your own good, and the other is for society's good. For your own good, it's because you're being subtly manipulated by algorithms that are watching everything you do constantly, and then sending you changes in your media feed, in your diet, that are calculated to adjust you slightly to the liking of some unseen advertiser. And so if you get off that, you can have a chance to experience a clearer view of yourself and your life. Uh, but then the, the reason for society might be even more important. Society has been gradually darkened by this scheme in which everyone is under surveillance all the time and everyone is under this mild version of behavior modification all the time. It's made people jittery and cranky it's made uh, teens especially depressed, which can be quite severe, but it's made our politics kind of unreal and strange, where we're not sure if elections are real anymore. We're not sure how much the Russians affected Brexit. We do know that it was a crankier affair than it might have been otherwise. You say it's bad for me as an individual. Is it bad for me because I'm addicted? Have I become chemically hooked? You have. Uh, the founders of the great Silicon Valley spying empires like Facebook have publicly declared that they intentionally included addictive schemes in, in their designs. Now, we have to say, this is what I would call almost a stealthy addiction. It's, it's a statistical addiction. What it says is, we will get the broad population to use the services a lot, will get them hooked through a scheme of rewards and punishment. Uh, and the, 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 the rewards are when you're retweeted, the punishment is when you're treated badly by others online. And then within that, we'll very gradually start to, to leverage that to change them. So it's, it's, this, it's this very kind of stealthy manipulation of the population. So it's not as dramatic as a heroin addict or a gambling addict, but it is the same principle. But who's, who's doing the manipulating? I mean, it, there isn't some master sort of wizard of Oz sitting behind a screen, is there? Well, this is the peculiarity of the situation. The people who run the tech companies like Google and Facebook are not doing the manipulating. They're doing the addicting. <laughs> but the manipulating, which rides on the back of the addicting, is the paying customer of, of, of such a company. So, uh, and and uh, many of those customers are not at all bad influences. They might simply be trying to promote their cars or their perfumes or whatever. And indeed, I have sympathy for them because they're concerned that if they don't put money into the system, nobody will know about them anymore. How is it different to just television advertising or billboard advertising mm. or anything else? The difference is the, the constant feedback loop. 
So when you watch the television, the television isn't watching you. When you see the billboard, the billboard isn't seeing you. And vast numbers of people see the same thing on television and see the same billboard. When you use these new designs, social media, search, uh, YouTube, when you see these things, you're being observed constantly and algorithms are taking that information and changing what you see next. And they're searching and searching and searching and, and they're just blind robots. There's no evil genius here until they find those patterns, those, those little tricks that get you and make you change your behavior. So back to the task in hand. Uh, you should have decided by now whether you want to make a conference or an esports tournament or uh, launch a game. So you're going to need things like a well-designed flyer and targeted ads on uh, Facebook. Um, you're going to have to think about who you're targeting. So if it's going to be a conference, then it's going to be games developers. Uh, if it's going to be an esports tournament, then it's gamers and the you know people who uh, like to watch Twitch. Look at any examples of the kind of thing that you're trying to promote and just see how they did their own social media strategy. So for instance, um, you know, League of Legends tournaments, you know, how do they promote those? How do they get people to watch? Or uh, same with the conferences, you know, how does GDC or E3 uh, get participants to buy tickets? Um, and you're also going to have to set yourself some goals. So um, this comes down to the monitoring side of things. So tickets sold for the conference or likes or followers on Twitter are all kind of um, good indicators that your uh, social media strategy is working. So how do you create a targeted ad on Facebook? Um, well, they make it very easy for you. Um, you can just go to the top, hit create, and then you'll see add. And then once you go to that section, you can create a campaign and you can start targeting specific audiences in specific areas or with certain interests such as gaming uh, or consoles. And you can start putting together your targeted ad this way. Here's a very interesting video on uh, how audiences are targeted on Facebook. Getting started with audience targeting. Effective Facebook advertising starts with creating a compelling ad, but you also need to find and target the right audiences to show that ad to, the ones that are more likely to click on it and become leads and customers. Facebook ads give you a huge opportunity to reach brand new audiences. The question is, which audiences do you want to reach and how do you reach them? With over a billion Facebook users out there to target, the only way you'll be able to advertise in a cost-effective way is if you target people who are most likely to become customers down the road. That means that you have to know your buyer personas really, really well. Buyer personas are fictional, generalized characters that share demographics, interests, and goals with your real and potential customers. What's your ideal customer's age, gender, location, and income level? What are their interests, like certain TV shows, books, blogs, or clothing brands? Creating a buyer persona is a process that requires a lot of research and real customer data and in interviews. But it's well worth the work, because buyer personas and targeted advertising on Facebook really do go well together. Once you have a really good idea of who your ideal customer is and what they're interested in, you'll be able to target them on Facebook much more effectively. So let's talk about how your buyer persona fits into the options available on Facebook. Facebook's audience manager tool is where you'll create and manage your target audiences when you're creating an ad. Here, you'll find that Facebook offers a wide range of targeting options that'll help you find the right niche. This is where a lot of people get tripped up. What kind of audience should you go after? How big or small should your audience be? How do you know if the audience that you chose is a good one? Facebook offers three primary audience types, saved audience, custom audience, and lookalike audience. Let's go through the basics of each of these so that you know what your options are. Saved audiences let you target people based on demographics, interests, and locations. For demographics, you have a lot of targeting options that help you refine your audience, like age range, gender, and language. 
For interests, you can target people interested in things that your target audience is interested in and are related to your business or product. So for example, you might target people interested in your competitors or your broader market segment or magazines and blogs covering your market. There are hundreds of interests that you can choose from. So instead of browsing through them all, you might just want to type in one interest and then look at the suggestions that Facebook gives you. Interests, location, and demographics are only a few options for targeting. You can also target people by their political views, life events, ethnicity, and so on. Company and job titles are good ones for B2B companies. For location, Facebook lets you drill down pretty specifically from country, region, and county, all the way down to city, postal code, or even a specific address radius. Location is not limited to just people who live in that location. You can also target people who are recently in a specific location, tracked by where they use their mobile device. Another option is to target people traveling to a location, which Facebook defines as users who had a certain geographic area as a recent location that's at least 100 miles away from their home location. This is great for businesses like local attractions, restaurants, travel businesses, and so on. Or you can target everyone in a location. So that's saved audiences. Now let's talk about custom audiences. Custom audiences let you retarget past website visitors and people who have engaged with your content or app. Because these people have shown interest in your brand already, they can be your highest value audience. There are a few different ways to create a custom audience, by customer file, by website traffic, by app activity, by offline activity, and by engagement on Facebook. By customer file simply means that you can target people who are on specific lists of email accounts, phone numbers, or app IDs. This is a great way to target your blog subscribers or app users. By website traffic means that you can target people who have engaged with your website, whether it's your website as a whole or specific web pages. Actually, one of the coolest things that you can do with this option is target people who visited a certain page but did not visit another certain page. So for example, you might target people who visited an offers page but did not visit the offers thank you page, which will help you retarget abandoned visitors. To create audiences based on web traffic, you'll need to install the Facebook pixel on your website. The Facebook pixel can track when someone visits your website and when they take an action like buying something, and it lets you target people based on those actions. Installing the Facebook pixel involves a simple set of instructions for placing pixel code on the header of your website, which we've linked to in the additional resources section. By app activity means that you can target people who have engaged with your iOS or Android app if you have one. To target people based on the app activity, you first need to register your app and set up app events. By offline activity means you can target people who have engaged with your business offline, whether it was in the store, by phone, or through other offline channels. You can retarget these people by creating an offline conversion event, like those who ordered from you over the phone. By engagement means that you can target people who have engaged with your content on Facebook, like visited your Facebook page, or engaged with your posts or ads, opened or completed a Facebook lead ads form, interacted with your Facebook events, or even visited your Instagram business profile. So monitoring, there's a few tools, and one of them is called Facebook Audience Insights. So once your campaign is launched, um, you can track who's looking at it, who's interacting with it, um, and this is also known as analytics, and it gives you raw data as to how successful your campaign has been. So if you're looking to have a career as a social media strategist, uh, you need to become familiar with the tools like Audience Insights um, in order to prove to your clients that you're doing a good job by promoting their products or services. Again, this is a purely theoretical exercise, so while you may not be actually launching a campaign itself, it's good to have some knowledge of these kind of tools that are at your disposal. So, as mentioned, Facebook Audience Insights and Google Analytics, um, they allow you to monitor the success of your campaign, and you can also use metrics such as Twitter followers, or likes, or shares, or retweets, um, and YouTube video views, and things like this, in order to assess 
how your strategy is going and possibly change it on the fly. So you'll be assessed for this unit. If you uh, look at your task sheet, there will be a number of questions on there and you'll be answering those kind of questions like, you know, what's the origin of the word narcissist and what is a meme and what is a viral video. Then you'll be creating a presentation with Google Slides which reflects your campaign itself. So whether it's this made up product or perhaps a game that's already being launched or your own idea for a game and you're going to need the following sort of page titles, uh, goals, key messages and content, action plan, audience, engagement, monitoring and analytics. Using the uh, unit materials and resources document you will be able to find a lot of information in there which will answer all of those questions and will give you all the information that you need in order to complete this unit. Thanks for listening.